Good morning. Um, we have at Vermont Technical College a small college right in the geographical center of Vermont. We are one of the state colleges. We have about 1,200 students. We have a secondary <coughs> campus uh, in Williston, Vermont, near Burlington, about an hour from our Randolph Center campus. And my colleague Peter Chapin is here, and he's teaching mostly up in Williston now, and I'm in, in Randolph Center primarily. Oh, I have some students I deal with remotely up there. Um, we uh, got involved with uh, CubeSats um, sort of about 11 years ago on a very sort of low level, you know, just sort of playing around with them and doing some studies. Let me interrupt. Yeah. Can you move the microphone up? Yes. Okay, is that better? Can you tell? Okay, is that better? Okay, yeah, so I'll try to stay close on here then. Um, and uh, we started looking at the possibility of sending a CubeSat to the moon um, and got a grant to look at the technologies involved, both with chemical rockets on the CubeSats and with ion drive. And in the middle of uh, that grant, looking at those technologies, NASA announced the Alana program, educational launch of nanosatellites, and all of a sudden, oh, we can actually get something in orbit. So we sort of put the other stuff somewhat on hold and proposed that we test some of our navigation technologies on a single a 1U CubeSat, a 10 centimeter cube, one kilogram satellite um, in low Earth orbit. And we were selected in the first group for the Alana program, and we eventually got launched. They put you in different launch groups and for various reasons with rocket problems. We got launched uh, November 19th, 2013 with our single CubeSat, which is, uh, this is a composite picture of a picture taken by the CubeSat I'll show you later and our CubeSat uh, put together. Um, the Atlanta 4 launch, uh, this was in, in 2010, it was announced, the program, and uh, we were launched on an on Air Force RRS-3 Minotaur-1 flight. This was arranged by NASA. So, so what that had to do with us is that we now had to deal with NASA and the Air Force, and they both had their own paperwork requirements. So we just sort of doubled the amount of paperwork with that program. Uh, we were launched to a 500 kilometer, 40 and a half degree inclination orbit. Um, there were 28 uh, CubeSats that were deployed from that rocket. 14 of them were Air Force, two were NASA and 12 University and one larger, about one and a half, cube, one and a half foot cube uh, TAC-3 uh, satellite from the Air Force. We don't know much about the Air Force satellites. They're mostly classified. We just got to ride on them, and we got to go into place a room at the Air Force Research Lab where a lot of stuff was behind blue uh, plastic so we can get to see it to do our integration. Um, so again, 12 universities, there were, um, only four of the university satellites out of the 12 were heard from at all. Eight were just dead on arrival. Nothing, nobody heard anything from them. We have to speculate as to what the problems are. Um, the people in the CubeSat community believe that the majority of these failures are software related and we sort of concur with that. A lot of the software technologies that are used are not very good. The people get uh, involved with CubeSats because they're attracted to the hardware and they forget about the software till the end. They don't know much about it. They don't realize that, in fact, the largest number of personnel hours in the project is going to be to software if it's done properly. And so the software is not done very well. Uh, the satellite is deployed, and the first thing it has to do, the software has to deploy the antennas. If it doesn't do that, you have a dead satellite. You're never going to hear from it. And uh, we have reason to believe that that occurred to a number of satellites. Um, so two of the satellites, uh, had one had partial contact for a week. Uh, one worked partially when in sunlight. They fried their batteries the first day. That was definitely software. That's the only satellite we know what the failure cause was. Um, and one worked for about four months and then stopped working. And ours, uh, as we said, many Vermonters did, took a two and a half month winter vacation. There was a hardware issue with a bunch of the uh, um, commercial software components or power supply boards. Uh, came with a pull-up resistor on an I squared C bus that shouldn't have been there and the value of the resistor was too low, and so the bus was sort of marginal as to whether you get any data through. And this bus, uh, for ours and a number of others, was required to deploy the antenna. Um, and 
the student who was writing the software basically had to do most of the time unsupervised because uh, uh, we just didn't have the personnel to be involved with that. And he had a loop to uh, check some stuff during a reboot and the two st one former student and the student who was working on the software decided to re reboot knowing there was a potential problem without talking to me and uh, the thing sat there in the loop waiting to get data through this bus that was marginal. And uh, so that was during the winter. And then, you know, winter vacation was over and the bus came back to life and we were back online and have been ever since. Um, so we are now in operation for over 23 months. Um, this is a chart from about six months uh, after launch from the Air Force. So you can't read the details there, but uh, green is good and red is bad. That's sort of what you have to know. The, at the top, all of the... Um, I've got a better pointer. Um, so all the green stuff, here, this is all Air Force stuff. The, um, the one horizontal green one there, that's us. And um, this green one here is a NASA one called Firefly. And this uh, green one here is a NASA one called Sponesat, and that's another Air Force one. All the other red ones are all the other university satellites, which are not looking too good at this point. Um, so we discussed some of the software reliability issues. Um, having design reviews, we really didn't do that. We didn't have enough people to, we actually didn't have enough people to build a satellite, but we managed to get it done. Um, the, what we did, which was good, is we used Spark Ada for our, our satellite. Now, using Spark Ada increases your reliability of the software enormously, and the Spark tools allow you to find errors when you're refactoring the software, which one does with spacecraft frequently, and you introduce new errors. And so the one student did not have somebody else to look and find their errors, but the software tools did that for him, and we wound up with working software. Um, we had uh, Spark does static analysis. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, we had a software repository. Uh, we used Assembla, and uh, that's important because it allows you to keep track of version control. And one of the failures, the one software failure we know, besides not writing the software failure, writing the software correctly and using software where a hardware solution would have worked better, um, they loaded their test software instead of their flight software on the satellite before launch because they didn't know too much about version control. Um, we had an antenna made by a company called Isis. Isis. This is one in Holland, not the one in Syria. Um, and we paid $2,700 extra for an electrical model to test the antenna because to deploy the antenna, actually test it, I looked at the instructions for restoring the antenna and I decided it was better to spend the $2,700 for an electrical model that would light up LEDs instead of deploying the antenna. And so we could test that our software was, in fact, giving the correct commands to this module. This uh, antenna module had two redundant sets of uh, CPUs on it and would have uh, resistors that would heat up and melt through some nylon thread that was holding all of the antennas coiled up inside their little doors at the end of the CubeSat. Um, some of the reliability issues, uh, most CubeSats have used C, as a lot of large satellites too. Um, there was one large uh, ADA uh, avionics program where they kept data on it, and about a third of the program was in C, about a third in ADA, and a third using Spark ADA. And this is a much earlier version of Spark ADA. Spark ADA is now much better. Um, the ADA alone had about 10% of the error rate of the C programs, and the Spark ADA had about 1% of the error rate of the C programs. Um, so we had a 10,000 line program in our satellite, so we'd see there would have been 100 errors, probably wouldn't find all of those. Uh, with ADA alone, about 10 error, about 1,000 errors, and with Spark ADA, um, about uh, 100 errors. Uh, sorry, I mean, sorry, wait, no, we had one, sorry, it was about 1%, so about, a, a, um, uh, what did I say, I, th I thought 10,000 lines, yeah, so 100 errors with uh, uh, C, 10 errors with ADA, and one error with Spark. Um, we found students could become proficient in a couple of weeks. So the excuse that I've heard many times in the satellite business, well, we can't hire people out of school who know ADA or Spark, uh, you can teach them very quickly. And so that's not really a, you know, if you want to use software that has a high chance of failure, you know, go right ahead. Spend your hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, Spark uh, is now starting to become widely deployed in areas that have mostly been used uh, where ADA has been used so far. Um, and SIGADA has posters showing ADA use in various places, and their sort of tagline is when the software really has to work. Um, uh, every <coughs> airliner is programmed in ADA. Every air traffic control system is programmed in ADA. 
Um, computers crash, and the word crash and airline are in the same paragraph is not good, so they tend to try to stay away from that. Um, here's some examples where Spark is used. Um, I just flew in, into an ADA conference in Europe in uh, June, and it was an Airbus, and the engines are controlled with computers programmed in Spark on the Rolls-Royce engines. The Air Inc. ACAM system, which monitors aircraft health, was developed uh, by Air Inc. and uh, um, NASA, uh, let's see, the one that's down in Southern Virginia, I'm forgetting, um, NASA Center that's down there. Anyway, um, uh, military avi aviation, the Eurofighter, the Harrier, if anyone's ever, the Harrier is the one that hovers and it's basically a machine that turns kerosene into noise in that time. Um, a couple of other aircraft there. Air traffic control system is under development now for the UK. At this point, it's about 250,000 lines of code. Um, and a number of rail systems in Europe use uh, Spark. All of the high-speed rails use ADA in Europe. Uh, and medical devices, new field where this is starting to take place. Medical devices kill people every year, but they kill them one of the times so they don't get the same PR that an airline crash has. Our current uh, one U CubeSat, uh, and there's some statistics on it, it's um, 5991 lines of code, 4,000 lines of comments, 2843 are Spark annotations, which I'll show later. Spark annotations give information to the tools that they use to help prove that your software is correct. A total of 10,000 lines, including, not including blank lines. Uh, the examiner, one of the Spark tools, generated 4552 verification conditions. So these are conditions that need to be proved to be correct to show that your software is doing what you think it is. Um, and that has a prover, which in this earlier version was able to prove 98% of their verification conditions. The UK system, which is using the latest version of Spark 2014, and a second prover in addition to the old prover, uh, is able to prove 100% of their verification conditions. Um, so we attempted to prove no runtime conditions and suppressed all of the checks. We'll talk more about checks on some examples in a little bit. Uh, there was some C code in here, uh, 2,239 lines, including blank lines. I don't know. Peter, do you have any idea what the percentage of the non-blank lines might be in there? Yeah, anyway, so some of that. Um, and I mentioned the additional provers. Um, so we're now working on a system we're calling Cubed OS, which will be a general purpose set of software tools, you know, named initially at CubeSats, but really could be used for any kind of uh, spacecraft and even other non-spacecraft real-time systems. It's written in Spark Ada and is proven free from runtime errors. We're currently uh, using that in development for our Lunar Ice Cube flight software, I'll show later. You know, Lun Lunar Ice Cube is our next CubeSat project. Uh, it can integrate existing A to C runtime libraries, uses a low level extraction layer, which allows you to make modifications to fit different hardware operating systems, um, provides intermodule communication, and the modules are independent. Um, it has asynchronous message passing system with mailboxes. And so a very simple system, uh, runtime library of useful packages, all verified real-time clock module, file system interface, radio communications interface, uh, modules for providing support for the CCSDS um, protocols for, uh, this is what the Deep Space Network uses for data transfer, and a general driver module that allows components to communicate fairly generically. Um, some of the advantages, uh, message passing architecture is highly concurrent, allows many overlapping activities uh, to be programmed in a natural way. Uh, we have a student who's implemented the CCSDS file delivery protocol um, and made use of this. The architecture provides a lot of runtime flexibility. Programs can adapt their communication patterns at runtime. The architecture is consistent with the restrictions of Ada's Ravenscore profile. Ravenscore is a profile for doing tasking, concurrent programming in Ada that can be analyzed uh, to be safe, because a lot of the problems with concurrent programming, you can get into race conditions and all kinds of other things. And uh, so Ravenscar was, uh, Ravenscar is a town in Scotland that where they had the meeting where they came up with this protocol, and we'll be using that. And the new version of Spark, which is sort of out now this week, uh, supports that. Um, there are a few disadvantages. Uh, the messages uh, have to do have some runtime overhead associated with encoding and decoding them, and there's some static type safety uh, because you're doing some of the stuff at runtime. Um, and you know we don't know I I exactly how analyzable all of the aspects of cubed OS will be because uh, Spark 2014 is adding features which will make it more analyzable as we're doing this at the same time. Um, 
Kubeco S, it's an ongoing effort and should be considered experimental at this time, but hopefully will not be experimental within three years when it's going to be on a very expensive satellite launch. Um, we hope to refine it and make it so it is a valuable thing and useful for lots of other people, and we hope to be able to distribute it to other people working on satellites or other systems. Some of the errors that uh, verification conditions proofs prevent with Spark A to A array index out of range, a type range violation, I'll talk about the Ariane 5, which had that problem below, a division by zero and numerical overflow, I'll talk about the Boeing 787 problem, both of which would have been prevented. Some examples of Spark annotations, um, Ada uses a double dash for its uh, comment indication, and when you add the pound sign afterwards, the Spark tools now look at that as a, uh, an annotation that they're going to get information. There's some examples up at the top that show the kinds of things that the Spark tools will take a look at and developing their proofs to show that your software is doing what it is. So here are two software failures. Um, the first one uh, was a very expensive failure. The second one was caught uh, not by the manufacturer but by the FAA in time to prevent a real disaster. And I'll talk about those. On the left, you see the Ariane 5 taking off on its first flight. On the right, you see it 37 seconds later. That was not what was intended. Uh, they were reusing software from the Ariane 4. Um, one of the things that they probably should have done, in my opinion, is they should have had a table that listed the specifications and requirements and flight path and all this kind of stuff for the specific spacecraft that they were using it, so that when they went to a different spacecraft, they'd put in these new numbers and then certain checks could make sure that they weren't having any problems because of the new spacecraft. The Ariane 5 is a more powerful rocket, has much larger acceleration on takeoff. As you're probably aware, most ro ro rockets that are launching satellites, they take off vertically and then they pitch over uh, to get in the direction they're going to be in orbit. And they have an angle of attack at this point. They're generating lift, so they have a lateral acceleration and develop a lateral velocity. The Ariane 5 had a much larger lateral velocity than the Ariane 4. Uh, they were reusing some software to align the inertial platform before liftoff, and because of the way that you had to reset software, if you had a, a hold on the Ariane 4 and earlier ones, they actually ran the software for 40 seconds uh, after launch. That was completely unnecessary in the Ariane 5. If they had, and it was an arbitrary time to run it for 40 seconds, if they had chosen 35 seconds uh, to run it, they wouldn't have had this failure. But there was no reason to run it at all, and they should have had it not running. Um, and we'll look at what happened. So it was reused, it was written in ADA. Uh, the greater horizontal acceleration caused this 64-bit uh, floating point number when it was converted to a 16-point integer to overflow the value. Although they had had exception handling protection for the variables for some of the variables in this section of software, they chose for quote efficiency reasons not to protect this particular variable. And so when the thing overflowed, it automatically tried to go to the backup computer, which actually had the same problem about 73 milliseconds earlier, and it had shut down. Um, and the software, uh, what it did is it turned off the flight control computer. That was its method of handling the exception. That was probably not a good idea. Um, and as a result, the erroneous data that came through because the thing being shut down was interpreted as a pitch over in the wrong direction, and the flight control software that was still operating then commanded full movement of the exhaust nozzles on the two solid rocket boosters and then the um, uh, main liquid-fueled engine causing a 20-degree angle of attack, generating sufficient aerodynamic forces that you now had three rockets instead of one. Um, and then the software that detected that the solid rocket boosters had separated caused the destruct mechanism to take hold and blow up the remaining part of the rocket. Um, so uh, these reference platforms, is, you know, shouldn't, this shouldn't have been going on. The financial loss, I saw one figure of $500 million, I saw another one of $700 million. Spark Aid would have prevented it, would have found that problem for you. The Boeing 787, um, Boeing never bothered to just run the software indefinitely and see what would happen, but the FAA did fortunately. And in the FAA lab, they found out after eight months, the software that controls the generators, it has two engines and two generators in each engine and one computer for each one of those, and this, it's written in ADA, and the software that controls that, um, FAA had running, and all of a sudden, after eight months, all the generators shut down. And they tracked it down and found that what they were doing is they were keeping track of the power on time in the aircraft. Now this is either that you know the generators are running or the things plugged into ground power or the APU is running, whatever, just there's power on. 
I've talked to a number of people, airline pilots and stuff, and I can't find any reason that they need to keep track of the power on. Running the engine on time, generator time, stuff like that is reasonable, but just power on. And they count in centiseconds. The only people I know who use centiseconds are track coaches timing their runners with their stopwatches, but they were doing center second, centiseconds. They were storing the power on time in a 32-bit register. If you use centiseconds, it overflows just after eight months. And uh, the computer that runs the generators uh, then puts it, the generators into safe mode. Now, this computer's idea of safe mode means to turn the generators off. So this plane has four generators. It's a completely fly-by-wire plane. So when you're flying along over the Atlantic in the middle of your flight, and all of a sudden it happens to be eight months that the power has been on, all your generators shut down, and the, you lose all control of the aircraft, and it crashes, and there's nothing you can do about it. So that's probably not what I would call safe mode. Um, and so the FAA said, uh, well, make sure, send out an airworthiness directive. Make sure you shut off your power before eight months. Now, it, you know, it's about three lines of code to fix this error. I don't know why they didn't say fix the error, except they probably would require the generation of months worth of paperwork to approve that error. But all you have to do is just check this time that you're storing, and when it gets to the maximum amount for the, for the register, record the time and date that that occurred and reset the register to one, start counting again. A very easy fix, but they didn't do that. Um, there's now a spark book available, so if you're, you're worrying about, well, I don't, can't train anybody, uh, it's a picture of our satellite up there over someplace on the Earth. Uh, and my colleague Peter Chapin and, a, and another friend wrote this book, and it came out last month, and so that's now available. People who want to use Spark have, have much greater chance of your software actually being correct. You're now able to do that. Um, this is the first picture we got. Um, this is the north coast of Western Australia. There's the missing Malaysian airliner. Um, and it was nice to see this picture. Um, really blew me away when I saw this. You know, here's this thing that I you know, put together with my hands, and, and Peter and the students wrote the software for, and it actually works. This is about 100 miles northeast of Perth. Uh, most of the pictures you get down, you can't tell where they are because there are a lot of clouds on the Earth, and mostly they obscure the geographical features necessary. We do have a few, I don't have them here, we do have a few other pictures that we have rough ideas because. We know when the pictures were commanded to be taken and roughly where the satellite was, and so you can sort of figure out what it was. We tell it to take a roll of pictures, not that we actually have film on there, but you know, it's about 30 pictures, and it starts taking them every, every period of time. I don't know what the actual period is. Another picture showing the limit of the Earth and a lot of clouds. I have no idea where that is. More clouds. Uh, this one was from June. Um, here's one. More clouds. This was from last month. So the thing's still working and sending us good data. That's what the thing looks like. It's a 10 centimeter cube, 1.01 kilograms. Um, has a GPS patch antenna there. That's the uh, camera lens as I'm kept on tape over it. This is just after a vibration test, so just to keep it clean. We normally had a, uh, our lens cap, but you couldn't leave that on the vibration test. It would have just popped off. We had 20 Gs of vibrations, and the thing worked fine um, in the vibration test, and the thermal vacuum bake out. Um, some comments, spark caught errors as we refactor the software, uh, because as you're making changes with the hardware or you understand it more, you have to make changes. Um, and it helped the discipline of the software during the turnover, because we had various students that would graduate. And you know, one of the pieces of information I got from other people who've done CubeSats, try to get them like freshmen or sophomores, so they're around for a few years. And we hadn't been doing that. We now have a student just came to my office last week, and, uh, or early this week, and hopefully he's a sophomore, and we'll get him involved. And, He'll be around for a few years. And the other thing is we have, we have one of only three software engineering programs in New England at Vermont Tech and a bachelor's degree, and we're now adding a master's program starting in August. Um, and these people really know how to write good software. And uh, it uh, shows in their salaries. They have the second highest uh, salary range of any career category other than Wall Street bankers to sort of steal money, but that's another story. Um, and... Uh, our student who wrote most of the software competed for a job with 20 other applicants who had 10 years experience on average each. He was right out of school and he got the job because he had the software engineering degree. And a month after he was hired, his salary got doubled because he, he had a security clearance going on because he had applied for a job at NSA. He wasn't really interested in it, but his boss found, had, knew about the security clearance and doubled his salary to keep him there. So that's, uh, that works out pretty well. Um, we would not have had the software finished without Spark helping us. I have no question about that. Um, and another comment on the bottom, the 
the limit on a single CubeSat is 1.3 kilograms. The paperwork might be 13 kilograms. I literally wrote at least 1,000 pages of documentation for the Air Force, NASA, NOAA, and the FCC all before launch. This is our new satellite. This is Lunar Ice Cube, 10 by 20 by 30 centimeters. We'd probably be able to increase those dimensions by five centimeters in each dimension as we have the jumbo deploying box, it turns out. Um, this one has a ride on the space launch system in three years to the moon. It has an ion drive here, and that's a printed plastic tank there holding one and a half kilograms of solid iodine with a little heater to sublimate it as needed. That's the propellant for the ion drive. I believe this will be the first spacecraft using an ion drive. It's undergoing life testing at the moment, uh, ion drive made by Busick in uh, Massachusetts. Um, up here is the, uh, an infrared spectrometer called Birches being developed at Goddard, and it basically they're taking, I forget the name of it, there's an existing larger infrared spectrometer that's in flight right now being used, and they're reducing the size to 10 by 10 by 15 centimeters. Very clever optical design. It's a neat device. I haven't seen it yet, but we'll be meeting down there in, in, in two weeks, actually. Um, I'll get the chance to see what they've done so far. Um, these are patch antennas for a, uh, an X-band radio, uh, 8 to 9 gigahertz radio that's uh, called Iris 2 that was developed at uh, JPL, um, the $275,000 radio, um, with $130,000 worth of parts, because all radiation hardened. And we'll be using the Deep Space Network to communicate with our satellite. I think we may be the first university people using DSN. Um, this is the ion drive in operation. The output grid is three centimeters. One of the clever things with this ion drive is instead of having a cathode for ionizing the iodine, they use a two megahertz RF field. And so there's no cathode to wear out, which is the most critical wear point. And so it's just the holes in the grid gradually get eroded and they figure they've got 20,000 hours of life on, on that with the grid. This is the iris radio. Um, a lot of metal on there because it has to be conduction cooled for all the things. It's a four watt output and I think it uses about 12 watts input. So it's about eight watts you gotta get rid of by conduction in the thing. It's 10 by 10 by seven centimeters. Um, and I, I've seen this out there. We were just, I was just out at JPL. We'll be using the same uh, ground software that the uh, New Horizon spacecraft used. We're using this stuff at, we were trained, getting some initial training at JPL and we'll be getting that software and be using it, uh, the Advanced Multi-Mission Operations software uh, from, from JPL. Uh, this is a block diagram at the moment. You know, this is just in its initial part of the design. There's still some changes that might be made. Um, we're using a Space Micro Proton 400K that's a radiation-hardened computer with a, a dual PowerPC Freescale processor. Um, and uh, various other parts in there are Iris 2 radio, um, infrared spectrometer and so on. Um, and some things that we don't know exactly what we're doing yet, you know, as far as some possible changes. The thing will have uh, dual star trackers and dual sets of momentum wheels um, also because it has to be oriented to point towards the moon to take data and then we have to rotate to point the patch antennas towards the Earth to send the data down to the DSN. Um, it will be in a, a highly elliptical orbit with a 100 kilometer perilune and a 5,000 kilometer apilune when it's orbiting the moon. We hope to survey every bit of the moon at all times of day with the spectrometer looking for water vapor, water ice, and other volatiles that might be coming up as the, room, the moon <coughs> heats up during daylight. Um, this was our launch, um, night launch on a Minotaur 1. The first two stages are from a Miniman 2 ballistic missile. The upper two stages are made by Orbital Sciences or by ATK for Orbital Sciences. Um, and there were four stages, and we got to see all four stages ignite. It was pretty neat watching that launch. And this is our new launch vehicle. This is the SLS, Space Launch System, which will be launching in three years, the most powerful rocket ever launched. The two solid rocket boosters are space shuttle boosters with an extra segment giving 30% more thrust, a uh, total of 7.2 million pounds of thrust between the two of them. Um, and then at the bottom, you have four space shuttle main engines that are being operated 109% nominal rating. They're being tested at that higher power rating at Stennis right now. Um, and hopefully that will be ready on time to launch uh, in uh, three years and one month is, ro is a rough. November of 2018 is the currently scheduled launch date. Here are some people who have helped us supply equipment and, uh, and software and so on. And one of the sort of interesting LED Dynamics um, 
Uh, they're all former students of mine, all physics students that have started this company in Vermont, Randolph, Vermont. They now have 50 employees. They're probably the highest tech LED integrating company in the world. They have lighting on the space station. They have lighting on the space shuttle. And they have LEDs on our satellite. Um, so they do pretty neat stuff. And their CEO spends his time downloading our pictures, too. So it's, uh, it's very good. Um, any questions? What was, your, what was your ground system for the first CubeSat? The, fir the ground system is my, my uh, former student, who is the CEO of LED Dynamics, has his own ground system. Um, and I forget which radio. It's one of the sort of standard ham radio uh, satellite radios. It's not the, At our school, we have a ground station set up, but we haven't automated it yet. And so he's got this at his house, so it's sort of easy for him to do it when he's home in the evening uh, rather than come off to school, which is not, it's only four miles away. It's not a big deal. Um, we have a much bigger antennas up at school and, and, uh, um, and an ICOM 910H. We're set up for 77 meter, 2 meter, and 1.2 1 gigahertz uh, ground station at the school. And we also have a dish that some students of mine put together, but we have to have structural analysis done on the roof of the building to see if, if it won't fall through the roof. It's 1,100 pounds. And so that's, we'll uh, use that, and they have 2.4 gigahertz and higher values. It's a 3 meter dish, my old satellite TV dish, that they mounted very robustly get it up to 1,100 pounds. Um, you've mentioned cubed OS uh, release, potentially. Is that planned open source, and do you have a timeline for that? So Peter, Peter, you want to answer that? Uh, oh, sure. So yeah, the plan is to, to uh, release it in open source at some point. There's no specific release date on the schedule like, like we said in the slides here. It's pretty experimental at the moment, and so it's, uh, it's, it's in the early stages of development, let's say. But yeah, down the road side at some point. You mentioned you had mostly ADA, but some C. What, what drove you to have C in the mix uh, relative to the success you were having with ADA? Pete, Peter could... could. So, um, you're referring to the flying mission there. So um, we have some, the C that we have is largely glue stuff to connect ourselves to uh, some of the lower, we were using some third-party C libraries that they weren't included in that, those counts for, for line numbers. So we had, we did some stuff with, um, it's just low-level hardware stuff that we weren't, in the earlier, in the earlier mission we were using a tool chain that was a little awkward in many respects in that we were actually converting the ADA into C with a tool called ADA Magic. It's a, um, it's an ADA compiler that output C basically. And, uh, and it, it proved maybe not necessary, but it certainly was convenient to use some, some C components there to, uh, to kind of connect it to some of the C libraries that we're using. So that's where that C is coming from. Yeah. I mean, we had to do that because there was no ADA compiler for the MSP430 processor that we had. So we used uh, ADA Magic, which took ADA and uh, as a front end of a compiler and the intermediate language was C. Then we got a C compiler to process it. Now, we won't be doing that for the new one. We have ADA compilers for the uh, uh, new processor, and we'll be running VxWorks as an operating system. We didn't have any operating system on the first satellite, just ran it right on bare silicon. Apologies if I missed this during the presentation. What was the original flight objectives for the first CubeSat mission, and what are you hoping to do with the Lunar Ice Cube? Well, the, the first one, uh, the real objective was to build a satellite, see if we could build a satellite and get it to work, you know, that's, and, and have students get experience with it. Um, and never really had any hope that we would succeed, but because we didn't have enough resources, but we did. Um, and I, I really firmly believe that the fact we were using Spark Ada allowed us to, to get it done and have it working. Um, a lot of people have showed you can build things and have them not work. and. Uh, and the software tools that help you are readily available for universities are available. The stuff you can download, it's all open source. Um, and I, it just is sort of beyond me why people insist on using C for stuff like this. It just guarantees you're going to have errors, no question about it. Um, the new one uh, is going to be looking for water vapor, ice, and uh, volatiles on the surface of the moon. Um, and it's a much more complicated project. 
Our first satellite we probably built for about fifty thousand dollars. I didn't keep detailed. So I haven't. I have the information, but I haven't ever bothered to add it up. The new one is a fifteen million dollar budget, uh, plus whatever the value of the launch to the moon is, which is certainly quite a bit. I don't know what you, how you value that though. Other questions? Well done.